Welcome to our second lecture within our course, Federated Learning. Today, I want to talk about uh, uh, the main design principle or one of the main design principles in machine learning, which combines three main components. So the first part of the lecture will be about three main components, uh, which are data, so we give a quick definition of data as sets of data points. Then we talk about a model. And we need a loss function to do machine learning. Yeah, I will share the, the uh, printouts of this uh, handwritten notes from me. So you don't have to take notes. You will also find all the information that I'm talking about in the, the lecture notes. So also get also my lecture notes here. So I don't forget anything. Okay. So first component of machine learning, maybe the most important component data. And uh, I like to think about data in a very generic sense, uh, very abstract sense, which is, gives you flexibility. So you can model many different application domains as data points, or you can uh, define data points in very different ways. In the end, you, for example, a data point could be a person, could be a person, some object that carries information. So we have one person, then we have another person. We typically need more than one data point. So machine learning requires often many, many data points, thousands or millions. On the other hand, uh, if you're good uh, uh, as a machine learning engineer or machine learning scientist, you might uh, tweak the, the methods that you need less data. So this is then called sample efficient machine learning methods. Okay, so a data point is an object that carries information. So this is quite abstract. Uh, an object has properties. So we have two types of properties in machine learning. Uh, one type of properties is called features. These are properties that can be measured easily in an automated fashion using a sensor or using uh, simple uh, methods or using not much intelligence. So the intelligence comes, comes into play when it's about to finding out the labels. These are the quantities of interest. So for example, for a data point being a person, let's say a data point is me, Alex Jung. So the features could be what could be measured easily. Uh, you could take a snapshot of me. So you see, I have a red, uh, a red pullover. You could see I have a beard, uh, which is also easy to measure, but might need more, more devices. So you might go to Devistalo, to your healthcare. You can measure the weight. You can measure the height. Uh, so these are all properties that one can measure in principle easily with, with hardware or simple devices. But the quantity in machine learning, we want to predict something, a quantity of interest. So what could be the quantity of interest for, for me personally? Well, for me personally, it could be a risk of heart attack uh, during the next year. It could be very in interesting for me of interest to me. Risk of a heart attack, so predictive uh, healthcare would be here an application. Uh, and these labels are, are not so easy to measure or determine. You can look in, in hindsight, you can look at patient databases where you know, okay, this person had this uh, weight, this head, and within one year later, after this diagnosis, uh, he or she had a heart attack. So you can get labeled data from historic recordings this is one main source to get labels. Another source could be a, a, an, an expert. Uh, so you could ask a, a healthcare expert to tell you how likely is this person having a heart attack during the next year. In the machine learning, we want to, we want to develop uh, programs. We want to develop software, machine learning algorithms that allow to predict the features, uh, that allow to predict the label only from the features. So we feed in the, the low level properties, the, the one we can measure easily and get uh, a prediction for the label, the quantity of interest. 
Okay, so far so good. Uh, are there any questions at this point regarding data? Yeah, it's uh, they're already design choices. So I always uh, hi highlight or stress that for data, we have a design choice, a model is a design choice, and loss function is a design choice. So for example, we could already uh, have the design choice, should we use the head of a person as feature or not? So this is uh, called feature selection, the design choice of which features to use. To some extent, what, what makes this modern machine learning methods like deep learning so, so nice or so convenient to use is that uh, the burden of choosing good features is, is reduced. You just stuff in everything you measure about a data point. So many, many features. And the deep neural network, for example, is able to, to find out what are the most relevant features. But still, you also have to decide what you feed in a deep neural network. So it's just shifted a bit, but still in the end, there is no fully automated machine learning algorithm that comes up with a machine learning problem and chooses the features of what kind of data should be fed in a deep neural network. I didn't see it yet. In some point, there must be a human like you deciding we now read in uh, these Wikipedia articles as text and feed it into some uh, natural language processing deep neural network. So at some point, there's still this decision which features to use. Okay. Then also the label is a design choice. The, typically in the application, nobody tells you uh, as a machine learning engineer, what should be the label? You want to, for example, develop a software, a healthcare software, and it's not so clear or it's not a priori clear if the quantity of interest is the risk of heart attack within the next year or the risk of heart attack within the next 10 years. So this is also a design choice you have to do. And depending on, on these design choices for the features and the labels, the resulting machine learning problem becomes more or less difficult. For example, trivially uh, predict, predicting the risk of heart attack within one year is, seems easier than predicting the risk within 10 years because one, prop, one label is basically determined by the other label. If you know, if you know for sure if, if uh, uh, a heart attack will, will occur within one year then, or you, there's a high probability, then you also know it will occur within the next 10 years, of course. So these different design choices yield related machine learning problems. And these machine learning problems are also called uh, machine learning tasks. So there's a field called multitask learning, where you look at how do these different design choices relate to each other or the resulting machine learning problems. So there might be one learning task predicting risk of heart attack within the next year, another machine learning task predicting risk of heart attack within the next 10 years. So these are different, uh, strictly speaking, different machine learning problems, but uh, obviously seem to be somewhat similar. So one predictor from one, if you have trained one model for one task, then it might be also a good choice for the other task. Okay. Yes, any questions at this point? What could be, there's one question on the chat. The question is, are there methods to reduce the input data used for machine learning, keeping the same results obtained using uh, big data sets? Yeah, so there are methods, as I mentioned, there are, to some extent, this feature selection can be automated. So there's, a, a, for example, these deep neural networks, which is, by the way, an example for a model. So this refers to a model, which I will talk about next. But it turns out when you use this model, you can feed in any low level features you have available, anything that might be completely unrelated. Let's say you want to predict my heart uh, attack risk and you feed in the current weather or temperature in, uh, in Rio de Janeiro. Might not be related, but you can feed it in and uh, the deep neural net might find out or hopefully finds out that this temperature in Rio de Janeiro is maybe not relevant for my heart attack risk. But what do I know? Okay, so then there's another type of methods called dimensionality reduction or feature learning. So these feature learning methods, uh, they are able to reduce a, a large set of raw features like uh, you, you take as, oh, you have this problem. Now I need to be aware of this synchronity here. Uh, 
you can feed in many raw features of a data point and this dimensionality reduction uh, outputs you, let's say two features, two new features, which still contain most, hopefully most information about the, the data point. Uh, yeah, let, let's look at an example. When you, when you take a snapshot of this uh, projection, of this video projection, uh, take a snapshot with your smartphone. I guess many of you have such a smartphone with a camera. And what would you take as the features of such a, a snapshot? Let's say a data point is a snapshot that you take with your camera. What would be a natural choice for the features to characterize the image? The pixels, yeah, the red, green, blue values of all the pixels. How many of, how many of such color intensity values do you get for one single image when you take an image with a, a modern smartphone? Sorry. A lot, yes. How, how many pixels does this camera have? 10, 100, 100 pixel camera? Thousand per thousand is millions, so megapixel. Typically, you want to buy a smartphone which has megapixel cameras, so millions of raw features. And what we will also see uh, later today, which will be maybe the main result of today, the number of data points you need for training a model is correlated or is related to the number of features often because the number of features in turn is related to the size of the model to the complexity or dimension of a model. And when you use uh, <clears throat> millions of raw features, then a first guess could be you would need or first estimate would be you need millions of data points. And this is uh, a lot to collect. So you might use a dimensionality reduction method to reduce these millions of features to let's say two features. And this could be useful because once you have, so let's say you, you have raw features uh, of an image, which uh, you could stack these color intensities into uh, a vector x1, x2, up to x1 uh, million, a very long vector. And then you feed it into a dimensionality reduction method and it gives you a new feature vector with two feature values. Does anyone of you know uh, about dimensionality reduction methods or feature learning methods. Which one have you heard about the most? PCA. So one such feature learning method is PCA. There's another question, John. Yeah, PC, I know that's the answer. <laughs> Very good, PCA, yes. PCA uh, is one method that allows to reduce this. And uh, does anyone of you know another method to reduce the dimensionality? TSNE, yes, it's more advanced. Autoencoders, yes. LBP, I don't know what that stands for here. Embeddings, yes. Has anyone of you heard about compressed sensing? This was the topic of my PhD thesis a long time ago. Uh, a local binary pattern. Yeah, so uh, feature, feature extraction methods for images, yes. So in compressed sensing, it turns out when you take uh, a random matrix, <clears throat> so you generate the matrix uh, by drawing random numbers, and you use this matrix uh, for mapping uh, to a two-dimensional vector, then you get often re uh, decent results. So uh, just using a, a random matrix, a uh, random projection, random projection. And the nice thing about random projections is you don't need to learn anything. You, you just need a random generator. So you need to randomly generate a, a, a matrix, a projection matrix that has two rows and one million columns. And you can then apply the, the big row or the long row feature vector. So why could it be useful to have only two features for a data point? Why did I pick two as the number of new features? You can? You can plot it. Yeah, you can make a, you can, you can draw this image. I mean, I can draw an image by just projecting it on the wall, but, can, but I can also draw an image, which is a data point by placing a marker in a two dimensional space where this is the first uh, feature and here, this is the second feature. So you can do scatter plots. That's why you might want to use dimensionality reduction or feature learning methods to visualize data. Okay. Yes. So. Within this course, I will stick to a particular type of features. 
the model complexity. Yeah, you might also want to have less features because the model complexity is, is smaller than, and you need less training data. So within this course, uh, each data point is characterized, unless stated otherwise, by numbers. So uh, one data point might have features x1 till xd, d features, and they live in the Euclidean space of dimension d. So this is the, or a toy feature space. Uh, and this might be non-trivial, but for, for our purposes, it, it's, uh, it's useful simplification. How, how would you get, uh, how could you get just uh, hinting at methods to get features for non-numeric data? What would be a non-numeric data point where you, where you don't see immediately what could be a numeric feature of a data point? A what? A could you? Yeah, maybe a cover. Uh, sorry, a, a cover. A cover. A color. A color. Yes, a color. Yes. Well, there are ways. Uh, color representations, categorical data here, categorical variables. Uh, mm, so, which type of object do you know where you wouldn't think about numbers? as text, text, okay. But then, yeah, we, we are all, I guess many of you had, had courses in computer science and programming, you immediately think about ASCII code. And so we immediately think about binary, binary uh, strings of, of binary bits or binary digits. So it's really hard to think about non-numeric data, but let's say we have some non-numeric data. So we have here one data point, non-numeric data point, and here one. And let's call one data point is FC Bayern. That's a data point. Then another, do you know another data point? So let's go to the other extreme. FC St. Pauli. This is for the insiders in Germany. And so FC St. Pauli is on the left for some reason and FC Bayern on the right. And then you could say that even- very well. <laughs> and who is on top? Uh, then we also have FC Barcelona. Barcelona and very on the bottom, Real Madrid, of course. <laughs> so I can make a few enemies here. <laughs> no, no, but FC Barcelona should be. Okay, so if you have non numeric data points like uh, soccer clubs, so for so those of you who, who are not from Europe, uh, these are soccer clubs, but you could still say, something about the similarities. So you could say FC Barcelona might be more similar to FC Bayern and FC Bayern might be more similar to Real Madrid. So even for non-numeric data, you might have a notion of similarity and you can represent the notion of similarity by a graph. So for non-numeric data, you might have graph representations. And as soon as you can draw a graph of your data points or a graph that, that relates your data points, you you can get immediately numeric features. Does any one of you have an idea how? How can we represent the graph? Either by a drawing or by numeric objects or numeric arrays. Yeah, let's say, well, for weights, we would need to know the numeric uh, extent of the, of the similarity. Let's say we don't know really. So there's just an edge or no edge or weight one or zero. So, but still we could represent it using matrices. So there's something called adjacency matrix. There's something called a Laplacian matrix. And one way uh, to, get, uh, to get features, numeric features for the nodes in such a graph is to use the eigenvectors of the Laplacian matrix. It turns out that often these are very good features, numeric features. So you, you uh, how many of you know the Laplacian matrix of a graph? So the Laplacian matrix is uh, a graph, uh, a, a quadratic matrix with number of rows and number of columns being equal to the number of nodes. So we would have four here. So each column corresponds to one, uh, one uh, node here. And on the main diagonal, we have the number of neighbors of each node. So Real Madrid has one neighbor. So let's say this would be the second and this would arbitrarily uh, in, uh, enumerate or index them. So the second one would have two neighbors. The third node, FC Barcelona has one neighbor. 
and the fourth one uh, zero. It's a bit it's a bit isolated FC St. Pauli. And on the off diagonal, we place uh, we place a minus one if there is a um, an edge between those two nodes. So between node one and node two is an edge. So we put minus one, and otherwise we put a zero. So this is a way to construct the matrix. This is called the Laplace matrix, and it turns out it has very nice properties. It's a, a positive uh, semi-definite matrix, so we can compute eigenvectors. A complete set of eigenvectors that span the whole uh, uh, Euclidean space R4 in this case. And these eigenvectors, the entries of these eigenvectors are often excellent choices for, for features for each node. So it, it's, uh, for example, you can use then these two features. You could uh, determine for each node two features and then use these features as the coordinates in this plane. I have randomly drawn this graph, but you can do this more principles to draw the graph using two numeric features that you learn via the Laplacian matrix. Okay, you will hear more about the Laplacian matrix in a following lecture on network models. So we, we will use the network structure uh, between data sets. So here I have used the network structure between individual data points, but the main use of, of networks in this course or graphs is to represent similarities between data sets between bunches of data points. Okay. So any questions at this point? Matrix representation graph. Yes, good answers. Okay, so that's what I had to say for data, which might be the main component. So let's, of machine learning, let's draw now a uh, a data set, a simple data set where each data point is characterized by a, a single numeric feature X and a label, a quantity of interest Y. So for example, each data point could be a certain day. So this day could be uh, the 20th of February this year. And the feature of this day could be the, the minimum temperature, minimum in the morning, let's say minus five degrees, and the label, the quantity of interest could be the maximum temperature in the evening or afternoon, let's say zero. So it would be useful to learn a predictor for the maximum daytime temperature based on the minimum daytime temperature, because this tells you if you should put on the big jacket for your skiing trip or not. Uh, so how do we do it? We, we, we learn a, a hypothesis map. So we try to find a hypothesis map that reads in the feature of any data point and outputs a prediction. So we, we get in some feature value X prime and output a prediction Y hat, which is the function value of the hypothesis edge. This is a hypothesis. Evaluated at this uh, feature value X prime. That's it. So that's what machine learning is about finding such a hypothesis map. Uh, so what is a model then? Well, a model is more than one hypothesis. We need more than one hypothesis, otherwise there is no learning. By the way, it still can be, can be challenging to use one single hypothesis because the evaluation, uh, it's, it's easily written here on my, on my iPad to, to evaluate. So I get a new data point in, let's say with, with feature value X equal two. And in order to find the predicted label value, I must evaluate the hypothesis H of X, which would be H of evaluated for the argument two. And this is easily written, looks very innocent, but it can be very challenging to compute this function because this function H, this hypothesis might be represented by a deep neural network with billions of parameters. So to evaluate this function might mean you have to feed in or make this forward pass, it's called forward pass, this computational steps to evaluate a deep neural network. So even evaluating a, a hypothesis might, might be non-trivial in practice. However, what makes it even more challenging is that we have to choose, we have to learn learn between different hypotheses. So we have here another hypothesis, H prime. Yeah, learning arises always when you have more than one option because then you can choose between alternatives. Uh, and how do we choose? 
how do we learn a hypothesis or how do we, we train a model? We need a loss function. And here already comes in the, the third component. I guess here it's loss function by minimizing errors. Yes, errors or loss function. So we need a way to, we need some means, some quantitative means to measure the quality of, of this uh, hypothesis. For example, of this green hypothesis. And for this, we need to measure the prediction error. So here we know the true, the true uh, label value was zero, but the predicted was, let's say, y hat, which is h of minus five, uh, is different than uh, zero. So we have a prediction error here. And we need a loss function. Uh, a loss function is just a, a precise way to measure the prediction error. So uh, one example for a loss function is the squared error loss. which is take the true label value, subtract the predicted label value and square it. That's the squared error loss. But that's uh, per se arbitrary. So also the loss function is a design choice. You can choose between different. Do you know another loss function that we can, you, could use instead of the squared error loss? Absolute, Absolute error, yes. Why might, might we, want, might we want to use the absolute error instead of the squared error loss? Yes, so it turns out this here is more robust to outliers. Okay. Uh, yeah, by the way, by the way, uh, this is, might be related to the quiz. So if you have a data set like this, so let's say in your data set, you have two data points that have the same feature value, but different label values. Then by the basic mathematics of machine learning, there's no way to get zero prediction error because what you learn is a hypothesis and the hypothesis outputs one and exactly one prediction for each feature value. So it cannot output two possible predictions for the same feature value. So the, the ability to predict well, not only depends on how powerful is the model, but also on the data. So if the data is very noisy, for example, for the same feature value, you have many different uh, data points with different label values. For example, you could, you could model this uh, by a probabilistic model. So you could say a data point, the label of a data point is uh, the sum a weighted sum of the, of the features of the data point, let's say it has five features, a weighted sum of the features plus something that varies randomly. And this you could model with, with a random variable. Let's say this could be a, a Gaussian with zero mean and variance uh, five. So then you can never beat this, uh, this intrinsic error in the data because you have to decide once you learn a hypothesis, you, you get always the same prediction for the same uh, features. So if this is the same, then also the prediction will be the same. However, the true label can vary around with this epsilon, which has variance five. So uh, the variance is related to the squared error uh, or ever, uh, expected squared error. So you will never go below squared error, expected squared error five. If the data is really distributed like this. Okay, so I, I think I now have explained all the three components. Maybe one, one more thing before I, I move on to combining them in, in our machine learning principle, which is called empirical risk minimization, uh, the choice of loss function. So these loss functions here, uh, the squared error loss, and the absolute error loss, they are only useful for numeric label values, like where the, the value of the label has a, a meaning uh, in the sense of, of a, a real number. So you can measure distances between those numbers. However, you might have problem, uh, other applications, for example, uh, what I call a binary classification problem, where each data point has numeric features again, this might be some statistics or the budget numbers of a, a soccer club. 
uh, or let's say no, let's say uh, some uh, a data point might be a, a, a soccer fan, and you have some numeric so, some numeric properties of of this soccer fan, like income and number of friends and weight and so. And then the label could be either FC Bayern fan or FC St. Pauli fan. So this is a, a, a binary classification problem. And we can use uh, what might be often confusing. You can use uh, the same models that you used for regression problems also for classification problems. In particular, the main model that we will use in this course is the, the linear model. So each hypothesis is parameterized by a weight vector and is given by this weighted linear combination of the features. So, but this gives a number. How do we get a prediction for FC Bayern or FC St. Pauli? These are not numbers, these are soccer clubs. So let's see, we have here a comment. Cross entropy loss. Yes. So we need different loss functions. We need different loss functions. But first of all, how can we turn, uh, how can we use such a hypothesis to predict the label? How can we turn a real number into one of two categories? We can uh, threshold it. So we can say if we, if we get, uh, a uh, function value larger equal than zero, then we predict y hat. So this is a prediction. This is the predicted label. This might be different from the true label, but we hope it's close to the true label. Then we predict uh, FC Bayern fan. Uh, whereas if this uh, a real number, this output of this linear function is smaller than zero, then we predict FC St. Pauli fan. Okay. So you can use uh, the same models for regression and classification. The only difference is a, a more or less trivial thresholding step or quantization step. But what is, what is then uh, so far so good? What is then often tempting is, okay, so we, we can use a, a linear map also for classification. So let's use also this. So we use the same model for classification. Let's also use the same loss function. Uh, this is not a good idea because if if you plot if you plot here uh, the the squared error loss as a function of this of this linear hypothesis, then it's increasing on both sides, and on one side it's wrong, uh, or it should not increase because uh, let's assume that uh, the true label is. Uh, the true label is FC Bayern. So the, the, the data point, the fan is an FC Bayern fan. And uh, to the right, we classify uh, larger. So we classify FC Bayern. So it means correct. And to the left, we would classify wrong. We would classify San Pauli fan, but it's a Bayern fan. So it's wrong. So, and here on the right, the squared error loss increases the more we make a correct prediction. Because it turns out we can use the, the absolute value, or we should use, it's a good idea to, to use the absolute value of this uh, linear map as a, a measure for confidence, as the confidence measure in the prediction. So to the right here, we are very confident in our prediction. Here we are very confident. Uh, in the middle here, we are less confident. So it really doesn't matter what we predict because we say we are not confident at all, but to the right, we are very confident in a correct prediction. And the squared error loss increasingly puts higher, higher loss, so penalizes this situation, which is not what we want. So what we want is we want to have a penalization here to the left, because here to the left, we are very confident. We are very confident in a wrong classification. This is the worst case. So here we want to have a high loss, a very large loss, whereas to the right, we want to have a smaller and smaller loss. The more we are confident in a correct prediction, the less loss. So let's say we have minimum loss value being zero. And so uh, loss functions for binary classification should look like this. And uh, the squared error loss is intrinsically not uh, serving this purpose because it increases on both sides. Okay, so there are some examples. One example for such a loss function is called the, the log loss or logistic loss. 
Do you know other examples for loss functions for binary classification? The hinge loss, yes. The hinge loss also looks similar, but what is the difference between the logistic loss and the hinge loss? Zero, yes. But uh, the, the mathematicians among you might uh, immediately get a it's not differential, but it has these corners, a corner. And we don't, uh, optimization algorithms don't like these corners because the challenge with su such non differentiable functions, which has a constant slope here and all of a sudden changes the slope, is that if you are here, for example, currently, so you, you, you try to improve the hypothesis more and more, which means you try to move here along the, the horizontal axis. If you are here, the loss function, when you look around the neighborhood, looks exactly the same as here. So you, you, you cannot distinguish for a non-differentiable loss function if you are here, very close to the optimum already, so you make only a small step here, or if you are still here, far away from the optimum, where you should make a, a much larger step. And this forces optimization algorithms for non-smooth functions to go slow, loosely speaking. On the other hand, when you have a, a, a smooth differentiable objective function like the logistic loss, then the the slope, the local slope, which is determined by the gradient, tells you already how far you are from the optimum. This is a lot of information because it also tell, it tells you to some extent how far you can jump to not overshoot. So that's why from an optimization perspective, we typically prefer differentiable loss functions like the logistic loss. However, why are there then still methods using the hinge loss and people using the hinge loss? Computationally, it's, it's uh, disadvantages, but it could be. We had a similar phenomenon already before for the, for the absolute error loss. It has um, nicer uh, robustness properties. It's more robust to outliers in the data set. Okay, so any questions at this point about loss functions, models, or data points, features, or labels? I guess this is pretty, maybe a, a reminder for many of you. Okay, so now to the main part of today, which is the design principle. And the design principle is to put together these three pieces by an optimization problem. So what you do is you have uh, your data points for which you know the feature value and the label value. You have your uh, model or hypothesis space. So a set of functions. So this all, this set of functions or so hypothesis space I, I denote by calligraphic edge. So this is called a hypothesis space or model. So I'm very, I'm very nerdy with using the word model. A model is a hypothesis space, nothing else. At least in my course. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, okay, and then we have the loss function. So let's say we have a squared error loss, which me measures the prediction errors. What we do is, yeah, what, what should we do now? So we can measure the prediction error here. We can measure the prediction error here. How do we combine the prediction errors? So this is the, let's say the, the first data point here with feature of the first data point. And here we have one, two, three, four data points. So this is the fourth feature value and this is the fourth label value. So how do we combine those individual losses? So I can compute the squared error loss here for the fourth data point and for the first data point. Yes. Yeah, why? Uh, and taking, the average. taking the average, yeah. So we, we could do the following. We could sum over all this. So M, okay, let's stick to the specific numbers we have here. One over four and sum up all the data, the prediction errors or squared error loss terms for this data set minus H. Uh, of xi 
So this would be the predicted labor value for the IF data point and squared error loss. Okay, and what we then do is we try to find the hypothesis which minimizes this empirical risk or training error. Why would this be a good idea? Yeah. Yeah. So one motivation for doing this is that if if this is not four, but maybe four times 10 to the power of 10, to the power of 10, a lot, then this approximates an expectation, an expected squared error loss. Minus X, where in this expression now, these are realizations or these are random variables. Uh, what is the probability distribution for this random variable su such that this expectation, uh, this approximation holds? Okay. Yes, yeah, pretty pretty much general. So uh, with some, with some, some, we did we do not need to know eh, this distribution, some uh, joint probability distribution. Huh. Is there anybody who knows the precise conditions on the probability distribution? I'm sure there are some technical conditions. So yeah, it must be integrable or somehow. So this, please read a, a probability theory book. A probability theory book. What's your favorite probability theory book or measure theory? By whom? <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Yeah, you can share it on, on Slack, would be nice. My, my, I, I learned probability theory from, from Billingsley and uh, who was it, Halmos. Oh, yeah, but because I don't understand Russian, as I understood most of probability theory has, the foundations has been laid by Russians. But, uh, written in German. Written in German, yeah, it's very interesting. <laughs> this is, uh, yes, so there are some technical conditions, but uh, these conditions are not too restrictive. So the sum or average uh, of, the, of the loss functions on the training error approximates, hopefully approximates, this expected uh, squared error loss or risk. So this is what I call also risk. And machine learning is about finding the hypothesis out of the hypothesis space or model that has smallest risk. However, we cannot evaluate the risk because often we do not know, you do not know the probability distribution from which the data is drawn. I have never seen a, a random variable in real life. I only see data. I only see uh, numbers. What we do with these numbers is up to us. We can, we can interpret them as realizations of random variables, but we do not need to. However, uh, let me tell you from what I have understood since now 20 years starting, Statistics, it's often a good idea to interpret numbers like that you download from some uh, database as realizations of a random variable. Can be really useful. And in particular in machine learning, it allows us to define a notion of risk. This is a, a, a useful measure for the quality of a hypothesis. We want to, we want to find a hypothesis. So with machine learning tries to learn something and learning means learning a good hypothesis out of a hypothesis space. And the ultimate performance criterion is the risk. So we want to find the hypothesis, which has an optimal hypothesis, which has the smallest risk. Does, does any one of you know how, if this would be possible, if we knew the probability distribution? Would it be much easier if we would know the probability distribution from which the data is drawn? Yes, so uh, roughly speaking, if you know the joint probability distribution, you can read out or uh, reformulate, manipulate this probability distribution to get an expression for the optimal hypothesis. Particularly it's related to the posterior distribution of the labels given the feature value that you observe. So you can read out from this conditional posterior distribution, you can construct the optimal hypothesis. Uh, does anyone of you know the name or how we call this optimal hypothesis in estimation theory? 
It's called an estimator, a specific estimator. It's called Bayes estimator. Bayes estimator or optimal estimator. However, there are two problems. First problem in machine learning, we do not know for sure often the, the joint probability distribution. So we would need to estimate it. This is one way to go. So you estimate using uh, maximum likelihood methods. You try to estimate this probability distribution. But then the second challenge, uh, it's easily written down this uh, conditional distribution, but in practice, it might be difficult to compute it. That's why you use approximations that are called variational methods that help you to approximate this, uh, finding this or finding this conditional distribution approximately. Okay, but we do not, uh, we do not take this route. So this route is taken in, uh, uh, for example, Bayesian data analysis courses or probabilistic machine learning courses. We take the different route, we take the optimization route. So this is my, my home turf, so to say. I, I look at these optimization problems. And in particular, when this optimization problem, uh, which is, so this here is the empirical risk. Let's color this in red. So this is the empirical risk and the empirical risk might be very different from the risk. So this is the empirical risk that we can minimize because we can compute it from the training error. But minimizing this might not yield a good hypothesis in, uh, in terms of the risk. How, how do we call such a situation when, when the training error is such, the training error and the model, so the shape of these functions, of these risk functions depend on both, on the training data and on the model. So these are coupled together. This empirical risk minimization problem couples together the data and the model and the loss function. Here, here I, I wrote down a specific loss function, but here you can use any loss function that you want. So in this optimization problem, we couple together all these three components and also these uh, properties of this optimization problem, like the location of the minima depend jointly on the data and the model. Uh, how, does anyone of you know uh, a password that refers to a situation where the minimum of the empirical risk, so if you train a model, you get small training error, but the risk, so the, on average, on all possible data points is large. That's overfitting, yes. So overfitting is when these two objective functions have very different minima. And yeah, this brings me actually almost to the last part. This is the question of when does overfitting happen? So can we tell beforehand, can we tell beforehand, before any training, if the, the machine learning method might overfit? So result in a small empirical risk, uh, learn a hypothesis with small empirical risk, but large risk um, and uh, error outside the training set. Uh, yeah, and there is. So, but before I tell you <clears throat> how to do this, or one of the concepts to do this, how would you find out if a method overfits uh, without any theory? In practice, when you do applied machine learning, so you train a model, let's say you are able to find the, the hypothesis with minimum risk, empirical risk, minimum training error. How do you find out if it overfits? Yeah, the, the prediction on the training error is perfect. So you get a really small empirical risk on the training error, but how can you tell how it does outside the training error? Yes, that's where validation comes in. And that's why it's so important. Uh, this is really the main rule in applied machine learning, never stop after training because you do not know if what you train, what you optimize in the training is completely different, a completely different loss function than the risk that you actually want to minimize. And one way to find this out is after you train, after you find a hypothesis, this is a trained hypothesis that has super small empirical risk on the training set. So let's say training error zero, <clears throat> perfectly fitting the training data, but you should then try it out on data points outside the training set. And that's exactly what the validation set is. It's just data points that have not been used in the training set. And this allows to estimate this difference between the risk and the, 
and the minimum empirical risk of the trained model. So there's one comment. So if I understand correctly, the minimization of the loss function yields to an empirical risk function while deducing the risk function from the underlying distribution yields a true risk. Yes, exactly. So the, the true risk, the, the ultimate objective function depends on the, on the probability distribution, which is often unknown, which we do not know. Uh, but what we can minimize is the, uh, is the empirical risk. So now I'm completely lost with my colors. So I used black for the risk. So this is the risk. This is what we would like to optimize, but we do not have access to it. And validation runs allow us to approximate the empirical risk towards the true risk. Uh, no, um, so uh, validation does not allow us to, to improve or to reduce the discrepancy, somehow a push the risk or the empirical risk towards the risk. No, it's just a, a diagnosis tool. It's, it's a diagnosis tool to find out if the, for one specific hypothesis, in particular, the hypothesis that we have learned by minimizing the empirical risk has a much higher risk. So that uh, validation is just a, a testing, a diagnosis tool. Uh, we will then hear about ways to, to actually avoid overfitting and actually make the risk or make the empirical risk closer to the risk in the next lecture next Monday uh, when we talk about regularization methods. So regularization methods are uh, techniques that aim to push this empirical risk function by clever, by changing in, in, a, in, in, in suitable ways the training error or the model, making the model smaller or making the training error larger by data augmentation, such that the empirical risk on the new data set is more close to the, the actual risk. So regularization would be uh, a way to push this together, uh, bring them closer to each other. But uh, validation is more as a, a pure diagnosis tool. Okay, so when does overfitting happen? Well, in general, it happens if the size of the data set. So let's say we have uh, uh, a data set. How, by the way, how would you measure the size of a data set? Of a data set, of a set of data points. You're already too far. You're already at the next step when I asked you, how would you measure a model? None of the data points, yeah. So one, two, three, four, five. This is the easy part. This is the easy part. Measuring a data set. Uh, by the way, uh, it might not always be so trivial. You could say, yeah, number of data points that you have, but let's say these data points are obtained from a time series like weather data over time. And uh, so each data point is obtained from a certain sample, time sample. And then it might not be such a good idea to use the, the raw number of data points as, as a measure for the size of the data set, because the size should indicate somehow how much information is contained in the data set. And if you have, if you sample very densely, then you basically sample the same value three times because the, the time series doesn't change fast. So you, you sample always over small uh, periods where it's almost constant. So here you might use a different notion for the sample size. Like you might want, you might know um, a time period over which it's approximately constant. This is called coherence time or something like this. So let's say TC. And then you might say you, you only consider one data point for each of these coherence time blocks as a, an effective new data point. So it might not always be so trivial to just count the number of data points. Yeah. Can we create, can we use uh, this kind of sample size by kind of uh, observing the object relation that we have kind of uh, Yeah, or... yes. So uh, I, I assume you, you had courses on uh, time series processing. No. So you know autocorrelation. 
Okay, yeah, but the autocorrelation, the width of the autocorrelation function is a, is a measure for this uh, coherence time. So the, the, the extreme case would be uh, uh, if, if this time series would be completely uncorrelated, then the autocorrelation is uh, a single impulse. This would mean that this would be IID data and IID data looks uh, not as the smooth curve that I draw. Okay, but let's say if, for the sake of simplicity, the number of data points is a good measure. Uh, yes. Yeah, you can do several uh, at more advanced versions like uh, taking into account the correlations between consecutive data points when there is a notion of consecutive data points. Uh, M. So this also I call sample size, sample size, M. And then <clears throat> the crucial thing uh, that, that determines if a machine learning method that uses this empirical risk minimization overfits is the ratio, the relation between the sample size, the size of the data set and the size of the model. So then we have a model calligraphic edge. For example, this could be the space of all linear maps, of all linear maps of, let's say, two features. So we have two weights and two numeric features. And the, this space of all these maps for different weights uh, is the linear model for dimension two. How would you measure the, the, uh, the size for, of such a model? Counting the number of different maps in the model? Number of features, yes. Why? Why would you say the size of this model is two? I have heard before already one, one way to measure it is called VC dimension. So what's the intuition behind the VC dimension? Okay, so I, I, the maybe the most popular way to measure the size of a model is called VC dimension. Uh, does anyone know what this V and C stands for? Yes, can you say it louder, please? Very good. Thanks a lot. <laughs> you helped me out. VC dimension, but I. <laughs> I want to avoid all this tech. There's a big technical apparatus behind this VC dimension. Uh, and to get the basic idea of, of this concept, I use a simpler term, which I call the effective, effective uh, dimension, DF of a model. And this is the maximum, maximum sample size that can, of data points that can be uh, perfectly fit perfectly fit. And it turns out that for many special cases, it disagrees with the CV dimension, in particular for a linear model, the number of, of, or the maximum number of arbitrary data points that you can perfectly fit with a linear model with two features is two. Uh, this might also be illustrated for a polynomial uh, model or po in polynomial regression where we use as hypothesis space, the polynomials with a given degree or maximum degree. So J1 till let's say two, degree two. Uh, so we have here these weights and the, the feature, but the power of the feature then. And then it turns out the number of data points that you can perfectly fit with a, a polynomial of degree two is two. So I give you any two data points, and you will for sure find a, a degree two polynomial, which perfectly fits those two data points. So you can even find, by the way, yeah, uh, you can even do better because I just find out there's two possible degree two polynomials. So it's not enough. There's the dimension is a bit higher by one. So with, is it degree two polynomial? So if I give you, three data points, you always find a degree two polynomial which perfectly fits through it. 
Yeah, I think so. Always? Not always. Not always. It can be vertically aligned, then it's not possible. So there are some nitty gritty details. Uh, like this statement here uh, must hold with probability one. With probability one with respect to some useful probability distribution. And I guess the, the difference between my simplified notion of effective dimension and DVC dimension is in the constraints that we put on these probability distributions. Okay, uh, I think we are finished here. I think I have only booked the room till 15 today. So let's then continue next Monday with what is left over from today and continue with regularization then next Monday. Yeah, I need to take then any questions now uh, offline, please, because there is already the next lecture coming. So please ask your questions on Slack or by email to our course email address. Thanks a lot.